Hi guys, welcome to another Flight Deck 2 Sim tutorial. In today's video, we're going to complete a full setup from Cold and Dark in the latest version of the Zebo mod. Now, the setup will be based on a three hour flight from Corfu in Greece to London Heathrow, and I'll be showing and following real world procedures as closely as possible throughout. Now, we'll also look at what information you need to take from the operational flight plan to set up the FMC. We'll also include a detailed taxi and seat briefing, and I'll also show you how we calculate takeoff performance using the Boeing onboard performance tool from the the electronic flight bag I use in the real 737. So let's jump in and get going. Okay, so now we're in the flight deck, you can see how it's completely cold and dark. Actually, Zebo's recently updated it to match the configuration of my company when it's completely fully shut down. The first thing we need to do is decide who's pilot flying for the sector. Well, the captain will be pilot flying. The pilot monitoring, in reality, would now be doing the walk around, ensuring that the aircraft is fully uh, ready for the flight and there's no damage to any external surfaces. So the first thing I'm going to do is bring some power to the aircraft by selecting the battery on selecting the GPU on the bus as well and very quickly we'll just verify we've got six green lights to the gear we've got three greens here and three greens here so six lights in total and then we check so-called the ship's library to ensure that we have all the paperwork and documentation for the aircraft things like its uh, operator's certificate certificate insurance a lot of this information we actually found on uh, the electronic flight back these days but some paperwork does still need to be present now we're actually going to turn the uh, electric hydraulic pumps on now as well in reality this is because the pilot monitoring is doing the walk around and he needs to spot any leaks from any of the hydraulic pipes services and any of the uh, uh, hydraulic pipes you might have in the landing gear bays as well including the nose wheel bay now actually what we need to do now is something which we couldn't do in real life and that's to set up the FMC for the zero fuel weight and fuel for the sector that's obviously something that's done by the fueler in reality but uh, you need to use the Zebo mod to do this and to do that if you go to advanced fuel and CG and what you need to put in here is the payload and fuel for the flight now I use Simbrief online to plan my flight plans because it uses the same operational flight plan format uh, that we use in real life, the Lido flight plan, it's actually really, really accurate and true to what we use. And the amount of uh, payload we have today is 16.2 tonnes. Now that's based on 150 passengers, some cargo and their baggage. So we'll put that there. You'll notice the camera's jolting there slightly as the weight increases. And the fuel we need for this sector, you can see here on the operational flight plan, is 10,342 kilos. So what we do is round that up to the nearest 100 kilos and then add 100 and you can already see here the fuel is 10.5 tons and this gives us a zero fuel weight of 57.6 tons this is the weight of the aircraft with pretty much everyone on board all the cargo and you've guessed it minus the fuel and that figure I got from Simbrief I will do a dedicated tutorial how to calculate things like that in uh, reality so we're now we've got all the baggage and passengers on board and the fuel on board we can actually carry on with what we do in real life next now the first thing we're going to look at is the fire test. So if I bring this here, uh, we'll, we'll move the fault in op test here. We verify we have faults APU detector in op. And if we move up here, we should have master caution overheat detector light illuminate. So we'll let go of the switch there. We can now do the fire test. We verify you have the three uh, fire handle lights, the engine overheat light and the wheel well light illuminate because we have AC power. And we also have the uh, fire warning lights illuminated both sides and the master caution lights. So we can now let go of that test. We now actually move to the overhead panel. We're going to put the emergency exit lights uh, to armed by moving the guard to this switch here, which leaves it in that position. As the fueling is complete, we can move the fasten seatbelt sign to on. We push the attend button to ensure that works. We check the flap lever position and you can see here it's in the default position of zero. And we also verify that the flap indicator is also showing up and the leading edge flap and uh, leading edge flap extension, sorry, and transit lights are extinguished. Continue moving down here, we actually do something called a takeoff configuration warning horn test. We advance the thrust levers to the stop and close it and verify that that horn sounds. Uh, we do need that horn for dispatch to work and we now can do the uh, cargo fire test. We'll check these switches later on during the setup. We just hold the test button down, again verify the forward aft uh, cargo fire lights illuminate, discharge light illuminates and the extinguisher green lights illuminate and also the, the bell you can obviously hear and the fire warning lights illuminated too. 
Now, we leave the weather radar as it is for now, moving down here, and on the real aircraft, just located here, we have the PA system, which we test. We ensure the manual gear extension door is closed, we can have a look inside there. You see, you have to make sure that's closed, because if it's open, it means the gear won't retract properly. Now, next we bring our eye line to the circuit breakers, and none of the circuit breakers are modelled with the mod, but uh, we make sure that none have popped, and you can see from this photo from the, the full motion level D simulator, that when one is popped you have this white collar. Now if that white collar is there, obviously it's popped, and you then need to contact engineering to see if you can push it back in and to see why it's out in the first place. Here we have the emergency escape rope for the first officer, make sure it's there and attached to the real aircraft, it's not modelled yet, but in reality you'd open it and make sure it's attached. We can now do the stall warning test, we hold that down, we make sure that the uh, control column is shaking whilst it's doing that. We can now do the Mac airspeed warning test, there's number one and number two. Uh, flight recorder test, all we do is simply move it to test, make sure the off light extinguishes and then bring it back to normal. Uh, also checking then on the overhead panel, both the reverse lights have extinguished, the engine control lights have extinguished, the EEC light should be on here, white, which isn't at the moment, but that's not to worry in the desktop simulator. Crew oxygen, we have more than 1100 PSI for dispatch. We can turn the dome light on to bright, off or dim, depending if you need it or not. Now this is quite important, make sure that you move the IRR, uh, IRS switches straight to nav. Now when you do this, you move this to heading STS, this is the amount of time it takes the uh, IRS to align, which is 11 minutes. And just verify it went to on DC and then the align light has come up as white. Um, here we have ELT, we don't have that fitted to our, our fleet. Uh, verify the all the lights are extinguished, you can push the test button to see if they work, there's no need to. Check the captain's emergency escape rope and also the captain's circuit breaker panels. Then lastly, in the real aircraft just fitted here, we have a crash axe. Make sure that's installed. Don't use the one that we have in the level D simulator, because you can see here, it's not terribly realistic. It won't help you get out in an emergency. And that's what we call the preliminary flight deck inspection. That just does the essential safety tests and ensure that the aircraft is getting ready for the next step, which is the pre-flight setup. So now the preliminary flight deck inspection is complete. Uh, the pilot monitoring will have completed his walk around. He'd now be back in the flight deck and they both now complete their pre-flight setup. Now starting with the first thing we need to do is the lights test. So pilot flying would move that to test and would do a panel scan just to ensure all the lights are illuminated. We have additional lights to test here, one and two for the autopilot and FMC status. So we'll move that to one and two. And then don't forget to include a panel scan here to make sure all the lights are illuminated. The only one that doesn't illuminate is the wheel well fire warning, which did illuminate earlier when we did the fire test. So now we've tested that, so we can move that back to bright. We can now set up the EFIS control panel. So what we'll select is terrain and airport. We can now set this to barrow and we're going to set something here called the minimum flap retraction altitude. Now this is typically a thousand feet above aerodrome elevation. Now the elevation in uh, Corfu is six feet. So a thousand feet on top of that is a thousand and six. And then we just round that up to the nearest 10 feet, which is a thousand and ten. Now this is the altitude at which we accelerate the aircraft in the event of an engine failure at some point after V1. At this point we accelerate uh, for the third segment level climb to clean up the aircraft as you probably saw on my engine failure tutorial. Now once that's complete we can now move this to hectopascals if you're in Europe and set the local Q&H which is 1011 and that's essentially it for there. Now Zebo's updated the mod so you can have a synchronization feature so also the first officers will be set whilst you set the captains which is quite useful in a desktop simulator as, you, as you're on your own. But I've obviously got mine on the realistic setting, I'll independently set his later. Now once the EFIS control panel has been set, we've done the light test, we can move down here to make sure the main and lower DE panel switches are in normal. As the IRS is still aligning, you get all these flags which is completely normal. We check the clock, we verify we have UTC which means, just, uh, which means the aircraft is using GPS data to set the uh, time. Nose wheel steering, check that's in normal, and then move your light switches to the position you need. I've just put the main panel switch to fully on, which is why you can see all these panel lights are illuminated. The first officer would do exactly the same his side, but additionally, uh, additionally he would do the EGBWS ground test. 
We then move down to the audio control panel. Here we set whatever we need for departure, the tower frequencies, the ground frequencies. I'm actually going to turn the marker switch to off and then just verify the weather radar's in the correct position. We then adjust the rudder pedals and seating position, and then we go straight to the FMC to set this up, which is obviously quite a chunky part of this tutorial because it's quite important you get all this data in correctly. So here's the FMC as it appears by default. So you can see here, here you have some messages from Zebo. you can have options for FMC A cars and advance to modify the FMC accordingly. Now I'm just interested in the setup today. If you have any questions about how to set up the advanced section, I might provide that information for you in another tutorial in the very near future. Now, if we select FMC, this is exactly how it appears on the aircraft, and we just verify we're on the IDEB page, which is the first page we need to go to. Now, we're just going to check the model number, which is obviously the 737-800 with winglets, the engine rating, which is full 26k, the nav data, which is the latest version, which I keep updated with my Navigraph subscription, and then we have the FMC version number here. Not too interested in the operational program number, not even sure what that means. Now, we now select pause in it, we can tell the aircraft where we are, which is Corfu, which is uh, Lima Golf Kilo Romeo. And now we can go to the next page. Whenever you see white boxes like that, that means this is information the FMC must have to during the pre-flight setup initialization to ensure we can continue the flight with the FMC. Now we're going to just select any of the GPS coordinates so we can line scratch those into the scratch pad and then put that in this set IRS position. Now you notice now the IRS is already aligned we now have the PFD the ND showing us our present position so that's all up to date and correct. Now if we go to the root page you can notice that it's copied the departure origin airfield into the scratch book for us. So all you need to do is line select that to one left, and now you can put the destination, which today is London Heathrow, Echo Golf Lima Lima. Here you can put the uh, call sign for your flight, so we'll just keep ours nice and simple. Flight deck to Sim, Foxtrot Delta to Sierra, and now we can put the routing information in. Now to do that, here you can see the operational flight plan. On the right hand side, we put the waypoint, and on the left hand side, we put any applicable uh, airway. Now if you see DCT, that means direct, you don't need to put an airway in. All you need to do is put the waypoints on on the right hand side. Now I don't want to waste my time or waste your time by watching me put all these waypoints in. So I'll do that now and you can meet me after I put all the waypoints in afterwards. So I'm just typing in the last waypoint for the operational flight plan, which is Alesso, which is the beginning of the arrival into... Uh, Heathrow. Now we can select the departure and arrival uh, SID star and runways in use. Now actually it doesn't matter in which order you do this, you could put the SID in first, then the routing, then the star. You could do what I've just done which is put the routing in, then the SID and star. It doesn't really matter. As long as you check for any route discontinuities afterwards, all is fine. So in Corfu today is runway 35 in use. We'll tell you the weather information in a little bit uh, of time. And we can select runway 35, and the departure we're flying today is the Old Gat 2 Foxtrot, which we can find here on page 3 of 6. Now we've selected the runway in use and star, we can go to Heathrow. The runway in use in Heathrow right now is runway 27 right, it's an ILS approach, and the arrival we're expecting is the Begin for Bravo. Now we're not expecting any transitions today, uh, so it should all connect. Now if you go to the legs page, we could now just flick through that, checking for any route discontinuities, which there aren't, it all routes all the way to London Heathrow. Once you've done that, we activate it, but in reality, we wait to execute it until we've done something called the route check, which is done by both pilots to comply that all the routing information is correct and matching the operational flight plan. So now we've done the routing information, we need to do the performance initialization. Now this is to tell the aircraft which uh, or what weight we're at and also to uh, select our options like our flat but a lot of that stuff does come later now at this stage all we're interested in is putting the zero fuel weight now in reality we put the estimated zero fuel weight in first and then compare it with our actual zero fuel weight when we get a document called the load sheet now with the beauty of a desktop simulator and the Zebo mod all you need to do is line select key three left and that puts the current zero fuel weight in there and that's all you need to worry about the reserves that comes from the operational flight plan so you can see if I move this to the right and on the left hand side you can see the fin res is 2147. Now that's the sum of our final reserves 
plus the amount of fuel it takes to all to uh, divert to our alternate, which is Gatwick, and that comes to 2147. So we just round that up to the nearest 100 kilos, and we put 2.2 tons. The cost index we're going to use today is 6, which is used by a few European operators to ensure that we have a nice fuel burn. This is decided by the company. We just simply select what the company wants us to do. Our cruise level today is flight level 340, so we just simply type that in there. The cruise wind, now we take here the top of climb wind, which you can see from the operational flight plan is 281 at 62 knots. So we type that in there. Oops, just got a message in the scratch pad, but you can see it's put it underneath that message, so we can type that in there. The ice deviation is plus 13 degrees at top of climb, so we put that in there, and it automatically then calculates the top of climb outside air temperature. The transition altitude, that comes from the SID plate, you can see it's 5,000 feet. Now, the performance comes in later, again, this is because the pilot monitoring might still be doing his walk around, and it must not be done individually, this must both be calculated independently by both pilots, and then checked together to ensure it's correct. So the only information we can put in at this stage is the temperature, which outside is 32 degrees Celsius, and we just then completely ignore all these settings here. We also leave the flap setting blank as well. Now if you're on your own in a desktop simulator, you can put all this information in right now, but I'm just making this as real realistic as possible to show you exactly what we do in real life. Now the FMC is loaded we can move to the overhead panel to ensure all the switches are in the correct position and configure them accordingly for the next sector. So moving to the overhead panel we'll start here on the top left hand corner. Verify all the flight control spoiler switches and alternate flap switches are guarded and in the off position and the alternate flap switch position is off as well. We select the your damper switch to on Navigation display switches, verify they're all in normal and the source switch is in auto. Verify the engine valve closed and spar valve closed are illuminated dim. As we have fuel in all three tanks, we can select all fuel pumps to on. Make sure you don't forget to check the cross feed valve selector. So we move it to open, verify this goes to bright and then dim to illuminate it's now open and then move it back to close, verify it goes from dim to bright and then off. Moving now to the next switch here. Here we have the AC-DC metering panel. Never really use it these days, so we leave it in the default switch positions. Verify the cabin utility and IFE passenger seat switches are on, and the IDG disconnect switches are off. We should have the drive lights illuminate because the engines are not running. GPU is available, and we have both gen off bus lights illuminate too. We can now move up to here. We can set the light switches accordingly. Equipment cooling is in normal. Emergency exit lights are armed, which we did earlier. Fasten seatbelts on. We've already checked the attend switch. Both the wipers are in the park position. We can now select the window heat switches to on, but the probe heats, they come on during the before taxi float. We don't turn them on unless we're in freezing conditions. Check the engine and wing anti-ice switches are in the off position. The electric hydraulic pumps on uh, at this present time because we were doing the walk around earlier, but if they were off, we would now select them on at this stage, verify that the low pressure lights have extinguished. Obviously the engines are not running, so the low pressure engine pumps are showing low pressure. Obviously during boarding as well, these li uh, lights would be illuminated to show you which doors are open, but they're all closed for this tutorial. Check the altitude indicates the elevation on the cabin altitude. Pressurization though, differential pressure should be zero, as should the cabin rate of climb. Moving up here, check the trim air switches in on, we move these switches. So this one's on A, this one's on U, and this one's on the letter T, and that on average gives a reasonable temperature in the cabin. We can now verify the recirc fan switches are auto, packs in auto, isolation valve is open, and engine bleeds are on, APU bleed is off. Now here we set the cruise level today, our initial cruise level, which is 34,000 feet, which is now set, and now we can set the elevation for Heathrow, well it's 83 feet, we just ran that up to the nearest uh, 50 feet, which in this case is 100. Pressurization mode selectors in auto, and this actually should be in steady already. That should have done. Uh, should have been done quite early. As soon as we get the AC power connected, that ensures the ground crew know that we are using the GPU and AC power is on. Now we check the engine start switch igniters on right, and both the engine start switches are off. Uh, Zebo's got the continual ignition version of the 737, so oops, uh, these should be in auto at all times. So that's it. So now the overhead panel's set up for the flights, we can now set up the uh, MCP.
Now for the MCP, we're going to turn the flight directors on at this stage. We can set here from left to right the courses which we need to use for raw data for the SID we're flying. Now, I've already set these up. We've got 345 and 310. That's because these are radials we're going to be using for departure based on the VOR. V2 will set later when we do the takeoff performance. We now set the angular bank selector to 25 degrees and we just simply set the runway heading, which is 345 degrees out of Corfu for runway 35. Uh, we can now set the MCP expected cleared altitude and we set that to the nearest 100 feet uh, from the cleared flight level until we have ATC clearance. Now, if you're using uh, VATSIM and you get your clearance online, you can then set that to to uh, the hard cliff level. We just set it to plus 100 feet to remind us we haven't got our clearance. Now for this tutorial I'm just going to set it to flight level 90 because we'll imagine that's where ATC has cleared us to. Now the MCP is pretty much set so we can now move the order brake to RTO. We now check the system page for the hydraulics, make sure you have a minimum pressure of 2800 psi and the quantity has no RF indication, in fact that's a little bit uh, low that side, but it's, as long as it's more than 76% that's fine for dispatch. Uh, we now select the engine display, verifying we have all of these displayed correctly, and fuel flow, oil pressure and oil temperature will become alive when we start the engine moving the start switch to ground. Standby instruments, make sure you can now set the Q&H as well, we hitch here is 1011. Carry on down here, check the staff trim cutout switches are normal, Weather radar is tuned correctly. Transponder as well, you'd wait until you've got the clearance. We'll imagine we've got the clearance now and we'll squawk something a little bit random, which is 2301. And then we continue down here and we do a rudder and aileron trim check. We just move it left and right, verifying that the white triangle moves. And for the aileron trim, we move that left and right, although it's quite hard to see here. We check the control column moves left and right. Verify the stab trim switches in normal, and that's it. That's pretty much the pre flight setup complete. The next stage is all the briefings and takeoff calculations. So now we'd need to do the briefings. Well, that starts with something called the route check. Well, down here, the pilot monitoring would read the operational flight plan, and the pilot flying would just verify all the information that we've inputted in is correct. We'd then step through this, make sure all the waypoints are in, any airways we've selected are on the left hand side. We would then execute it, make sure we have the magenta line, and you then also check the progress page to ensure that we have uh, enough fuel on arrival, which we do is plenty, 4.9 tonnes. And the ground distance here, 11.32, it's pretty much similar to what it says on the operational flight plan, but you can see here it's 11.35, so that's absolutely fine for what we need to do today. Next, we complete the instrument cross-check, so we'd have a look at the time, verify all the settings match together, and we also verify the stand standby instruments are all set. We would then complete the uh, a takeoff briefing, just explaining who's flying, what noise abatement departure procedure we're we're doing, any adverse weather conditions. There's lots of things we might mention, and then we do the emergency briefing as well, where the captain and first officer both explain their actions in the event of a rejected takeoff, and also what would happen in the event of an engine failure shortly after V1. Now once that's complete, the first thing we need to brief is the taxi. Now if I bring up the taxi chart here for Corfu, I'll show you where we're currently parked, which is stand 5, and it's a very short and easy taxi for us. We're just going to taxi straight ahead, right turn, and then backtrack for runway 35 for departure. In fact, if you look out the window, you can already see the holding point Charlie, where there's a ground baggage truck for some reason is uh, entering the active runway, but we'll ignore that fact, <laughs> it's nothing to do with us. Uh, once the taxi briefing is complete, we then brief the standard instrument departure. Now the SID we're flying today is the Olgat 2 Foxtrot. You can see here on the chart, we're going to be climbing straight ahead onto a distance of 2 miles from the Gar VOR. Left turn, track 265, and then we'll intercept the Kilo Romeo Kilo VOR on radial 310 to join the Lima 53 airway to Olgat. Now first thing we do, the pilot monitoring, Sorry, the pilot flying would explain to pilot monitoring how all the information in the FMC is correct. So we go to the plan page, step for it. So you can see there's the two mile point from the VOR. Left track 265 and then we're intercepting the 310 radial from the Kilo Romeo Kilo VOR. And that's why I have 345 tuned, which is just simply runway heading. And then the VOR 310 track is set to. Now if you look down here onto the pedestal, you'll see I have all the applicable VORs already tuned for departure. We have 114.7 for the Kilo Romeo Kilo VOR and the uh, Garitza Golf Alpha Romeo 108.8. So 108.8 on the 345 track, we would set that to 310 to 
ensure that we were tracking that radial on departure. Now, once we checked all the nav aids, we then just make sure all the altitude and speed information is set for departure. We have 210 knots or below, that's just for the initial turn for track keeping. And we've actually been cleared to a flight level of 90 for this clearance, there is no set flight level on the operational flight plan. And we just set that as a, uh, as a hard flight level, which we could just simply put here. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not come up there, but it should do after you've executed. I'll feed that back into that information for Zebo. But that just sets it twice to ensure that VNAV will level off at 90 if we forget to set that correctly on the MCP. So that's it. Once you've checked the SID routing matches the FMC and the operational um, chart, uh, the chart for departure, the SID briefing is complete so we can now complete the pre-takeoff performance calculation. Now, to calculate the performance, in reality, we'd wait for a document called the load sheet, which contains all the loading information, where the passengers are distributed, but we're really looking for that uh, information based on the zero fuel weight, which we input earlier. So on the init ref page, we'd select the zero fuel weight, which we're using today, which is 57.6 tons, and then we'd execute and just verify that the gross weight matches what the load sheet says, which is 68.1 tons. But this is the figure we're going to use for our takeoff performance calculation. Now, to uh, calculate the takeoff performance, we need to get the latest weather information. Well, it's an absolutely scorching day in Corfu using live weather. At the moment, just checking the weather on my phone, it's a surface wind of 330 at 5 knots, visibility 10 kilometers, it's 32 degrees, 2.22, and the QNH is 1011. Now, all that information we'd now input into the Boeing onboard performance tool, which you can see I have a copy of here. You just select the um, Airport, which is Corfu, the runway, which is 35, the condition of the runway, which is dry, the surface wind temperature, QNH. Rating we're going to use is optimum. Flap setting for takeoff is going to be 5. Air conditioning in auto and the anti ice is off. And you can see here with a takeoff of 68.1 tons, we could take full 26k with an assumed temperature of 35 degrees Celsius. So it's quite a lot of our takeoff performance we're using. Now it defaults to 26k. We can now select an assumed temperature of 35 degrees, which I've done, and we just cross-check that the thrust setting in the OPT matches that on the FMC, which it does, 99.0, and we have 99.0 here too. On the takeoff page, we can now select the takeoff flap setting, which is flap 5, and again, verify the takeoff speeds match the OPT. In this case, you can see they're within what not, so they're all acceptable. V1 is 39, uh, rotation speed is going to be 41, and V2 is going to be 50. And then we just simply set V2 at this stage here. And that's it. We then calculate the stab trim setting, which I've done off the load sheet. Actually, with Zebo's mod, you can simply select this, and it gives you the trim setting, which I'm unfamiliar with this. We don't use this system in our airline. Uh, whether this needs a correction or not, I'm not sure, but we typically change that by a few units. I'll just simply set 5.17. It's not exactly how it's done in real life, but it's certainly fine for a desktop simulator. Now at this stage, once the takeoff performance is all complete, the aircraft's pretty much fully set up, ready for the engine starts. The number one would shut the door, which we're going to do now. And there's a little switch here which we move to normal to make sure that no one outside can uh, gain entry. We make sure that our seatbelts are strapped and fastened, and we'd actually turn the APU on as soon as the uh, doors are all closed, ready for that. So we'll start the APU now, and when the APU is ready to put that on the bus, we'll put it on the bus. Okay, so as soon as the APU generator off bus light is illuminated, that means it can be used for AC power. So make sure you select both those switches are on. And now the ground crew will remove the ground power. If you don't do this before that, you get all the electricity go off. You'll have a total loss of AC power, and it's quite embarrassing. Uh, we'll should then try and get AC power to restore all the systems. Now, once that's complete, we'd then have to wait one minute to select the APU bleed on, but I'm not too worried about that in a desktop simulator. And now we have duct pressure. And because it's very hot in Corfu, I'm actually going to turn the temperatures down to get some air conditioning into the cabin. And now at this uh, stage, we complete the safety inspection and before start checklist. Now, I'm not in a position to share that checklist with you because it's not mine, it's the companies I work for. But there's lots of checklists available online that just basically ensures that we have this configuration, which we now have uh, ready for the pushback or in this case, uh, engine start on stand.
So I've just completed the checklist, everything's correctly configured, uh, ready for the engine start. Now the first thing we do is wait for the cabin crew to tell us the cabin is secure. Once it's secure, we move this switch to the auto position, and that's just to remind us as crew, obviously this is no longer used anymore, uh, that's just to remind us as crew that the cabin crew are ready for the engine start. When the cabin is secure during the taxi out, we just move this switch to one to again remind us it's ready for, uh, it's fully secure, ready for takeoff. Now at this point we'd contact tower, request engine start, there's no pushback required here in Corfu, it's a remote stand. And once that's been complete, we move the transponder to out off, that shows them where we are if they have ground radar installed, very doubtful in Corfu. Uh, we then move the air conditioning packs to off, which you need to do otherwise the engine won't start. Verify the isolation valve is open, AP bleed is on, anti-collision light is on, and the parking brake is set, which it isn't, it should have been, but I must have knocked that off at some point during the tutorial. We then complete the checklist to ensure we're there and co correctly configured for the engine starts, and we then talk to the ground crew. Now, to talk to the ground crew, in reality, on the control column, there's a switch on the back of it we push. It's the bottom switch, or you could move this switch here uh, to int in the intercom and talk to the ground crew that way. We confirm all doors and hatches are closed, ground equipment's removed from the aircraft, and we've been cleared for the engine start. And all we'd simply do is tell the ground crew, we're now starting engine number two first. They check it's clear, and all you simply need to do is move the switch to ground. As soon as that moves to ground, the EC gets energized, N2 starts rotating. You'll see oil pressure and uh, fuel flow and all temperature come alive as the EC gets energized. There it is, and we're just simply waiting for 25% in two to move the start lever to idle detent. Just carefully scanning for the parameters for any exceedances, especially when we move the uh, start lever to idle detent. There's 25%. Carefully monitoring N2, making sure it's rotating. Really monitor the EGT. If that starts shooting up very quickly above 500 degrees, that's the signs of a hot start. And the pilot flying does the engine start. He'd keep his hand here on the start lever, monitoring this start for around 56% N2. That's the start switch moving to uh, off or auto in the case of Zebo's mod. And it's a little bit longer to, to get the N1 stabilized in the mod. I think Zebo's working quite closely on that. But that should be, as you can see, slowly approaching 20% N1, EGT is going to be around 400 degrees, fuel flow around 300 kilos an hour and N2 60% and then the N2 is stabilised and that's it, that's how you start the engine, we just simply repeat that for engine number one by moving the start switch to ground. Okay, so we have two good engine starts. You can see the N1 is stabilized around 21%, EGT around 400 degrees, fuel flows both showing 300 kilos an hour, and N2 around 64%. We can now blank the, the uh, lower DU. We then wait for the ground crew to confirm that we've had two good engine starts. They they walk, then they'd walk away. We'd wave them off, making sure they show us the bypass pin, which they probably didn't have because we didn't get pushback. And at this point, we've now configured the aircraft for before taxi, which I'll do for you now to show you what you can do. So, generators would go on. We can now turn the APU off. Start switches to continuous. Probe heat to on. Packs to auto. Isolation valve auto. APU bleed is off. We can now set the flaps for departure, which is flap 5. And we can now do a flight control check, so I'll bring up the control column for this. And the pilot flying would do this with the pilot monitoring follow through, uh, following through. Uh, fall forward, fall back, fall left, centre, fall right, centre. And then with the rudder, fall left, centre, fall right and centre. The captain would hold the tiller to ensure that it doesn't turn. Verify the stab trim set for takeoff. Start levers are in idle detent. We then push recall. And then we'd call for the checklist to ensure that it's correctly configured, ready for, for our taxi. Alright guys, that's the end of the cold and dark setup tutorial, all the way from cold and dark to ready to taxi. I hope you found that interesting and learned something new. I'm now going to go and complete that flight to Heathrow, doing some testing for Zebo as I'm 
continuously in conversation with him, giving him feedback on the latest version of his mod. Uh, you can see here, for example, on the left-hand side, it's not currently there, but we have the EFB coming soon, where you can actually configure the aircraft accordingly, and there'll be lots of new features uh, in upcoming releases, so keep a close eye on the x 11 forum for those updates. I hope you found that interesting and learned something new. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and if you have any questions, leave that in the comment section. Fly safe, and I'll see you for another Flight Deck 2 Sim tutorial in the very near future. Take care. Bye-bye.